I describe this in this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. Basically take you through the laws of physics, explain why the universe must be as big as it is, why it must be as old as it is. All of it plays a role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings. Uh, let me close with a couple of short stories. Uh, I was on an airplane once, well, I was actually waiting for an airplane, and uh, I got called up to the front. That's not always a good sign. And uh, they said, uh, you know, Mr. Ross, uh, we have to give up your seat. Can we put you in first class? And I said, I think I can handle that. So <laughs> it's only the second time in my life I ever flew first class. And I wound up being seated beside this gentleman, and he said, I never fly first class either. But he says, Microsoft is insisting on flying me first class. I'm consulting for them. And I said, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a quantum physicist. I'm from Germany, and I'm an atheist and a skeptic. Now, <laughs> rarely do people introduce themselves that way to a total stranger. <laughs> so he said, well, what do you do? And I says, well, I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm an astrophysicist. And I'm not a skeptic and an atheist. I'm a Christian. And he said, this is going to be a really interesting flight. <laughs> so, and he peppered me for two hours with eight questions. First question he asks is, well, if God is responsible for this universe, why does he waste himself by making 200 billion galaxies? Certainly one galaxy would be enough. And maybe we don't even need a galaxy. Why not just our planetary system? Why not just the sun and the earth? So I explained to him why you needed exactly 50 billion trillion stars, no more, no less, for life to be possible. You can't even get carbon and oxygen unless the universe has a highly fine-tuned total mass. And so he said, well, I've got another question. And then he went on with another question. And then he finally asked me, he said, why are you so pre well prepared to answer these eight questions that I gave you? And I said, well, the eight questions you asked are all chapter titles in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And I said, you're not the first person to ask me these questions. I said, I get these kinds of questions all the time. And he says, I got to see this. And I said, well, I actually have a copy of the book in my briefcase. So I pulled out this book and he looked at the table of contents and says, you're right. These are the eight questions I was asking. And as we walked a baggage claim together, he calculated for me the probability that a German quantum physicist who's an atheist <laughs> would be seated in first class beside, uh, you know, an astrophysicist who is a Christian. He says, it's way less than one chance in a billion. And he says, I know what happened today is not an accident. He took a copy of the crater, in the, of the, pardon me, why the universe is the way it is. And as we're walking to baggage claim, he says, you know, I'm German. And he spoke excellent English. But he said, do you have anything in German? And I said, yeah, I do. I gave him a copy of our DVD, uh, Journey Toward Creation. It's in 11 languages. And by the way, at our table, the book is there and the DVD is there. So you can be praying for the German quantum physicists. And uh, I'll close with just one more quick story. And uh, it features this thing. It's a DVD you'll see out there. It's called The Great Debate. That's not the title we put on it because this debate happened at Caltech at the International Skeptic Society Conference. And it was a two-day conference where they brought in leading atheist scientists from all over the world to speak on the non-existence of God. And then they had me at the very end debate uh, Victor Stenger, a particle physicist. And uh, the great debate is actually the message you've heard today. When I had my chance to speak, what you heard today is what I gave them. And what you're going to be able to see in this debate is how an audience of 700 highly educated atheists from around the world responded to what they heard you, what they act, actually what you heard this morning. Now, I'll tell you the response because it's not on the DVD. What they told me afterwards was this is the first time they'd ever heard a scientific defense of the Christian faith. They said, we've been exposed to many debates between Christians and atheists but this is the first time we heard a scientific defense. And it says, well, it probably gave you the idea that we Christians don't have a scientific defense. I said, that's exactly right. We assumed that science was on our side. We had no idea it was the other way around. The other thing they said, it's the first time we've seen a gracious defense of the Christian faith, which is why I want to leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. 
Always be prepared to give good reasons for the hope within you, but with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. The unbelievers out there are waiting for us believers to respond with grace, humility, and wisdom.